Caleb Hunter? Here. Matt Johan has been present. Jeanette Heckner? Here. Scott Polkmeyer? Dan Coots? Here. Rick Masterson? Brian Putnam? Dick Ruffcar? Robert Schmidt? Here. And James Tardani? Here. At this time, uh, the minutes for the June 20th meeting were sent out an email. I would accept the motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion or additions? All those in favor say that we say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. At this time, we would open up public comment. We'll close public comment. And we'll go into the 2019-2021 TIP project presentations. And we will start with the city of Darden Prairie. Kehoe Engineering Company with City Engineer for Darden Prairie. And here to talk about uh, Missouri Route 364 improved access at Technology Drive Concept Study Funding Application. Uh, this project uh, would be a study of 364 in the location shown here. It's just to the east of Interstate 64. Uh, at the end of Missouri Route 364, west end of 364. This was part of the, uh, the phase three of the 364 project uh, ending at uh, Highway N and in, in Interstate 64. We would specifically be looking between Bryan Road and the interstate. It's uh, about two miles of roadway that would be studied in the surrounding areas. It's a uh, major arterial, and I uh, just recently read in the paper that uh, the ADT is near uh, 78,000 vehicles. Uh, currently, the city of O'Fallon is uh, studying improved access on the Interstate 64 between Winghaven Boulevard and the um, interchange on Interstate 64 with Missouri Route 364. And the city of Darden Prairie, the city of Lake St. Louis, St. Charles County, has been uh, working together to uh, look at the impacts to the, uh, both negative and positive, to the uh, area along that uh, section of Interstate 64. During that conceptual study, uh, we looked at the uh, need for improvement to 364, specifically at Technology Drive. There's uh, currently just a uh, just a half of an interchange there. If you are heading westbound on 364, you can get off of the highway onto Technology, and to get onto the uh, Missouri Route 364, you can only get on going east. So on and off of there. And uh, what we'd like to do is to study the <coughs> possibility of putting in a full interchange there. Uh, and we believe that it would be beneficial and the study would, would uh, prove that out. Uh, the project would include LIDAR collection, looking at uh, utilities in the area, what um, utilities would be impacted, also uh, what utilities could be uh, improved uh, or extended or enhanced. Uh, as a part of the uh, improved access project. There would be a preliminary design that would be used, a, uh, an engineering, uh, the engineering design that would go into a future project would be part of this, part of this conceptual study. We would get uh, current traffic counts, and then there would be a, a, a study modeling of the uh, traffic impacts to the changes to the highway. And then uh, we would coordinate with MoDOT and Federal Highway Administration with any proposed improvements. Let's see. Um, I think I've talked about this. 
Okay, so there was a, uh, there's limited amount of right of way there at this uh, Missouri Route 364 and Technology Drive because of the uh, interchange with 364 and the AASHTO uh, design requirements for, uh, for a limited access roadway. And so uh, one of the ideas that, that was uh, contemplated was similar to what happened at Spady Road when the uh, design build project happened on Interstate 64, a folded diamond was used because of the limited amount of right of way there. And so uh, that's the, the concept that we'd like to move forward with. There's the Spady Road interchange, um, Interstate 64. See, the, you have a full access onto Spady from the interstate, to and from the interstate uh, in a very small amount of right of way. This does not meet the current standards, and uh, we would need to go beyond what, what's used here. But this uh, fully functioning, recently constructed uh, interchange. There's the uh, a zoomed in location map with uh, our concept of, of what could potentially be built there. You'd see uh, a couple locations here. We have a, a short distance of uh, frontage road where we could also have some uh, local access off of there beyond uh, just improving the access to technology, which it's labeled there as hanky. Uh, it's technology to the south and technology to the west. It makes a left-hand turn there at Hanky and Fizer. Uh, some roundabouts would be uh, study here. Uh, the southern roundabout is, uh, would be in the area of the St. Charles County Skate Park off of Highway N. And then uh, there's a northern roundabout that we contemplated that is uh, Morningstar Church property there that would be uh, impacted. So moving a little bit closer, uh, this is the uh, Target J.C. Penney Shop and Save uh, Dardentown Square development. That is a, uh, they would be greatly impacted by improving access into this area, but also other properties in the area of Lake St. Louis and Darden Prairie and some unincorporated St. Charles County properties would all be uh, impacted economically uh, for sure with uh, improved access at this location. This is a, the existing ramp that this was uh, part of the 364 extension uh, this is for getting on to the uh, highway off of technology. The other, uh, the other ramp, the mirrored ramp of uh, getting off of the highway onto technology just north of 364. This is looking off of the highway into the uh, St. Charles County Park area. There will be some impacts to this area, some reconfiguration of the of the park would be uh, necessary at the, at the edge of the park. This is looking north uh, into the Morningstar Church property, Dicey Road beyond that. Uh, wide open at this point. And then the uh, overall uh, cost for this, the uh, concept study is $150,000, and uh, the city is requesting an 80-20 split with, with the county. Any questions? We'd like to, and I did not mention we'd like to do all this in, in uh, next year. Yes, Mayor, I didn't see you back there. Oh, sorry. I just want to take a moment. I'm Mayor Dave Zucker from Darden Prairie, and this is a big deal for us. The Town Square Shopping Center uh, is really hard to get to, as anybody who's tried to shop there will testified to. Uh, it accounts for about half of the city's revenue and if we can't enhance the access from 364, I, I'm concerned about the long-term viability of that shopping center. Uh, if you're in Lake St. Louis and headed on eastbound 364, you have to drive two miles to Bryan Road get off and double back on in in order to get to the shopping center. Uh, uh, there's also development that's going on in uh, uh, Lake St. Louis that would benefit from having uh, better access off and on both, both east and west 364. 
and in the packet you'll see a letter of endorsement from the mayor of Lake St. Louis as well as from the mayor of Old Fallon. And this idea, uh, let me go back to the, to the over. <clears throat> First time I saw this, I scratched my head and said, what? But uh, it, it, was, it was given to me by uh, John Gratschew as a, something to chew on. And the more I study it, the more I realize this is a this is a godsend. I don't want to I don't want to overstate this, but this is a godsend for Darden Prairie and the surrounding area. So you can get off and on in both directions, and and close by the economic beating heart of Darden Prairie, and for the long term viability of our of our community. We really, really need this, so I urge you to approve the application, and I thank you. Is MoDOT saying that yet? Um, yes. yes. Good, because the, they'll be the yeah. one you really got to get tucked into the yes. thing. Well, because they have, and and uh, it was suggested in our dialogue that because we presented this as part of the uh, I-64 Outer Road study, and they suggested we peel that off and come uh, and, and present it as a separate project. So that's why we're starting here. Good. I'll be happy to answer any other questions that you have. Thank you for letting us go first. We have a Board of Aldermen meeting back in Darden Prairie, and we've got a student. No problem at all. all right, thanks. No, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Next up is City of Lake St. Louis. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Derek Castle. I'm the director of public works for the city of Lake St. Louis. We've got three projects to talk about this afternoon. Uh, our first project is Hawk Ridge Trail, uh, Freemith Lane. Um, it's, uh, this is a design, property acquisition, construction project. Second project is Lake St. Louis Boulevard, phase three. Uh, again, that's uh, uh, designed for construction, and Old Route Inn is just a study. First project, Hawk Ridge Trail, uh, Freemith Lane, is um, Located uh, along Lake St. Louis Boulevard, south of 64. Now, while we're on this slide, I want to take a moment to point out um, some changes that have happened over the last 10 years. Uh, people in these subdivisions <clears throat> through here used to have access straight out onto Highway 40, but when Highway 40 was upgraded to interstate standards, they um, <clears throat> captured those entrances and built this outer road, connected it into Freemont Lane. Freemont Lane's an old County Road, which goes back further than that, it was uh, originally basically a, a wagon trail. It's just been upgraded through the years. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't really been upgraded or, or looked at for 30 years since before the uh, uh, that interstate project. So it's um, it's not much of a road. Uh, it's 20 feet wide, um, open ditches where there are ditches. Um, Pavement's not in real great shape, even though it was overlaid back then. There's just not a lot of pavement structure there. Um, and um, even though it doesn't see a lot of traffic, uh, we kind of view this as a, a safety concern for the residents in the area and a, uh, um, this just kind of um, creates a problem for these lots right in this area that are developable and, and the residents that that now have to suffer with this road where they used, used to go straight out on, on the highway. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead to this slide uh, and go back to that previous one. Uh, about a little less than 10 years ago, Lake St. Louis and County Road Board did a study for a outer road or an extension of Hawk Ridge Trail. And we have shops at Hawk Ridge right here. It's Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, Highway Inn comes right through here and the idea was that we could create an outer road that would connect into Interstate Drive in Wentzville and we'd have a continuous outer road system all the way past 70 down 64 
uh, come up here with Lane, cut across some vacant property here, tie into um, Howie Inn, and, and tie into what O'Fallon's looking at now is, a, is an outer road project here on 64. Uh, so it was an opportunity to get a continuous outer road system through through the through the region. Um, some of the concerns have been though that uh, this bridge at, uh, crossing here at Perk Creek is really expensive. Um, you know, MoDOT's in a situation where MoDOT can't they can't take a new bridge like that. Um, we really can't afford to build it or maintain it. Um, so moving forward with this global plan has just really not been something we could afford to do. Um, that said, it's it's really an important project for the city and we're concerned that particularly in this area um, that we've got some development starting to happen here right now uh, and we're afraid we're going to lose some of the property um, that we need for this corridor to happen and it's all it's all really happening right here. If we can tie this corridor up and get, get a road built in this area, we can preserve the opportunity to do this outer road in 10, 20 years when, when that's feasible. Um, additionally, we've got uh, a new development, AD Homes, going in right, right here. Um, so the project that we're proposing um, is uh, a realignment of Freemouth Lane right now. Freemouth Lane zigzags up the hill. It's real steep. cuts back and forth. Uh, we can correct that horizontal alignment, bring it up to modern standards, and really improve the vertical alignment um, for, for, this, uh, for that road. We cut off Hockridge Circle right here and realign that in to Freemouth Lane. This is all stuff that came out of that study that the County Road Board helped us pay for. Um, right here is a property, uh, 430 Trinith Lane, that went up uh, on the market last year. The city views this project as important enough that we actually acquired that property when it went up for sale because we didn't want to lose the corridor. We didn't want a commercial development to come in here. We didn't want a, a, a family to move into that house and, and be looking at relocating them if we were doing the project. So we wanted to lock that up. The project is almost a three and a half million dollar project. Uh, we're asking for an 80-20 split with the county. Um, but I, I do want to point out that, like I said, we've already acquired the home at 430 Freemouth Lane. We're not asking for the county to reimburse us for any of that. Uh, and at the terminus, of the north terminus of this project, we've got a $650,000 uh, project that's uh, budgeted and we're acquiring right away for it right now. We'll be doing that this year or early next year for a culvert replacement and three or four hundred feet of pavement replacement where we'll be widening that road some that will tie right into this proposed um, job. So upgrading this corridor is something that's really important to the city. We're putting our own money into it, but this is a piece that we just can't fund on our own. Are there any questions on that project? Well, we're going to see most of the right of way coming in now. This property right here has got a pretty significant taking. Okay, yeah. um, that's also one that is ripe for development. That same property owner has a parcel right here that's under construction right now. There's a nice uh, two-story uh, large um, uh, office building that's going in there. Um, and I really see this just a matter of time that somebody's going to want to come in on this. And we, we want to get this project going before that they don't happens. have access to that. You've got that corner. This piece? Uh, going up toward, towards the highway that's always been for sale and all that. The with access. This, with this, beat, with this, this would have access to this road, though, too, wouldn't it? Uh, maybe to not, some degree. Maybe not with the elevation. The, that property, there's a um, there's a creek that cuts right through here. It's really deep. This culvert is almost 50 feet under, under Lake San Luis Boulevard. So it's incredibly deep. We don't think that even if you could do the environmental um, mitigation to fill this creek in that it's a good idea to have a culvert that deep so this is never going to be a continuous developable property so we've got a par parcel here and then we've got a parcel here this has been platted for um, commercial or, or office development for almost 15 years not quite that long uh, they built this bank there 
and that's really all that's been able to move forward. Um, this property right over here, he has access rights out on the Lake Sands Boulevard at the, at the signal. The problem is building that is pretty costly and pretty complicated, and there's not a lot of developable land at the top of the hill to serve it. And then you have a big grade change from the back to the front. So the back side of this property would be served by this more likely than not. Uh, and so maybe you might have something like an apartment complex or something like that that would be served by this. Um, or maybe if it becomes uh, the outer road before it's developed, then it would be something, um, you know, a higher order of development. Any other questions? But this property here uh, could potentially get access off of that, and there's a road here that would be, this is already supposed to connect to Freeman, so it'll definitely connect through here, so we'll have a lot there. Lots there. We'll have a nice lot left over right there. <coughs> okay. Next project is Lake St. Louis Boulevard Phase 3. Um, phase 1 and Phase 2 of Lake St. Louis Boulevard were funded by County Road Board and Federal Grant. Um, Some of the existing conditions we're trying to address with this project is um, the pavement condition is pretty poor. Uh, the road just wasn't built to be able to catch traffic it's seeing right now. Uh, we're between nine and 10,000 cars a day on the road right now. Um, then we've also got some other challenges, some need for turn lanes and we have a side distance problem right here at Rue de Pay and um, um, Lake Forest Circle. Um, kind of hard to see, um, but I, I, right here is, is sitting on Lake Santos Boulevard trying to make a left turn on the route of pay. And you can't really see it, but there's a top of a car right here. It's only about 150 feet past that intersection. Um, so making a left turn here is, is it's kind of it's kind of scary. Yeah, you, you really have to uh, um, be careful. And we have similar problems making a left out of route or, or right out of route of pay, seeing that traffic coming up the hill. It's pretty challenging. So we want to address that. The problem with that is that even though we view this as a safety problem, the residents are, have identified it as a safety problem and asked us to fix it, we haven't had a lot of crashes there. And since we haven't had crashes there, we don't score well on the federal grants and we really don't score that well on the county grant. So um, because of the extra cost that's added to the project and because of, and then you add that to the new scoring criteria at the federal, uh, at East West Gateway, um, we applied last year and we're not selected and we really think there's not much chance that we're gonna get funded this year. Um, so we're asking, uh, the county road board to help us with this without federal money because it's just probably not going to happen. Uh, so the project starts. But you did apply. We did apply. We've applied twice now. Um, That's what we asked. Uh, we're, so we're at Blue Cove Terrace uh, for the start of the project, and right up here is the Spillway Bridge, uh, kind of the, what we call the uptown district in Lake St. Louis. We're at a left turn light at Bedoke Cutoff, and at the uh, apartments there at Earth Bluff. Uh, we have this section here where we're doing vertical landing corrections, so we'll take the whole pavement out there. Uh, lower part of that road, about two feet. Uh, take that that uh, that hill down a little bit so that you can see. Um, what we just talked about, and the total project's about two and a half million dollars. And again, we're asking for eighty twenty with the county. Uh, and again, so this earlier we've we've done two applications and it just doesn't look very good. Uh, but we would if we if the road board did uh, <coughs> select us for this project, we'll apply again next year, and <coughs> maybe we can reconfigure the project. Maybe we only apply for the profile correction. Maybe we apply for everything but the profile correction. We'll we'll look at ways that maybe we can improve that score. Any questions on that before I move to the next one? Final project is Old Route N. It's a, it's a study here. Um, this is a, 
going to be a, a something that the city of O'Fallon and Lake St. Louis work together with. Uh, we are in the midst of um, working on an intergovernmental agreement with O'Fallon um, on this, but we, we offered to just go ahead and take the lead and try and get this moving with the study. Um, we've got old, um, Highway N now crosses 64 uh, and ties it through 64. It used to come straight, straight through here. Uh, when the shops at Hawkbridge were built and the interchange was built together, that was the county road board project. Um, well, this piece of end was, was cut off and, and abandoned. Um, so we've got some land here that could be used for something that's not really um, got good access. There's a residential subdivision that is being constructed right now. I think there's M23 maybe half a dozen houses up so far. Um, and we have a commercial subdivision right here in the city of Lake St. Louis that we're working through the planning process on. Um, so there's some good opportunities here. The county Road Board's already um, helped to fund um, Orf Road um, a reconstruction project here, and that will be out for bid um, in the next month or two. Uh, so the existing conditions we're looking at, it's, a, it's an old MoDOT road. It was cut off and abandoned. It's going to see no, um, practically no traffic and no maintenance for 15 years, and now we're going to put uh, a residential subdivision on it, um, and we want to connect some other commercial property to it. Um, and that, that residential subdivision, just by the way, is in O'Fallon. Uh, and they left some frontage out in front of it for commercial lots. Um, so, um, this also is going to create an opportunity for a regional traffic improvement, which would be a bypass of the signals at Lockridge Trail and Highway N and Summers and Highway N. Uh, those signals are fairly congested already, even though we just improved um, Hawkridge Trail and Highway N, it's still fairly congested. So um, we've got um, got Liberty High School down here. We've got the Target right here that uh, Dr. Perry just spoke about. So we've got people down in here that want to go shop Target. We've got people over here that want to go to the high school. If they can cut through here and stay out of these uh, signals, that we think that'll be a, a functional improvement for those signals. So the project would connect Summers Road to Hawkridge Trail, uh, largely on the, exist the existing alignment of Old Highway N. Um, we need to determine what the traffic is going to be. How many people are going to want to make that um, bypass of Highway N? Um, so we'll have a traffic engineer help us with that. Um, that'll help us determine what type of intersections are appropriate on either end. Uh, originally, we were been planning on a roundabout up here at Hawkridge Trail. Um, our our traffic volumes on Hawkridge Trail are have, have grown so much that that may not work. Uh, we may have to use a signal, but if uh, if a roundabout does work in this location, that would probably be our preference. Uh, we also need to look at Summers um, at the Summers End. We've got a signal here, right here, Ronald Reagan and Highway N. We're pretty close to that. So we need to figure out, can all the movements be accommodated? Are we going to have to um, cut off left turns for one movement? Um, what can we safely accommodate with this? Um, and we anticipate a three-lane section, um, and um, the, what we'll be asking the, the consultant to provide for us is a, is a budget, a concept plan, utility complex, uh, culvert type recommendation for this creek so that we can put together a good SD, uh, SDP application. And, uh, so, kind of sum that up. Um, we're, we're looking at improved access for residential and commercial developments that are planned or, or in construction, and um, we want to bypass those two signals on Highway N. Um, this is the commercial development that is, is going through the process of Lake St. Louis. And right down here is that commercial property. You can, I don't know if you can see it there, but we've got commercial lots here. Uh, well, actually, commercial lots here carved out from this set, uh, 
from this residential subdivision, and then this property was retained by the people that sold that uh, lot off to the developer. Are there any questions there? Is that the old Menards? It yeah. was the it was the site that Menards was looking at. So, yeah, and then and then this this lot here that really doesn't have access now would would have access on this new road. Well, that's what the study is going to need to show for us. Um, you know, I, I think there was there was a concept plan floating around that, that showed this as a right only and, and no lots out of it. That's what we're going to ask this, the consultant to, to figure out for us, to model that for us. And that's really, I could throw together a, a cost estimate to connect a road from here to there, but if it's not going to work, that's, we don't want to do that. That's why we need to do this study. Uh, our, our cost estimates, uh, $60,000 for the total project and an 80-20 uh, split between the county and the city. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Next up, City of St. Charles. I'm the project manager for the City of St. Charles, and I'll be presenting the 2019 TIP applications. The city has uh, five uh, projects in order of priority. Uh, one uh, is the West Clay Street Rehabilitation, also known as the Drossy Road at West Clay uh, Overages. Number two is the Dr. Town Road Phase 2 project. Three is the Zumbel Road Culvert Replacement. Four is uh, a roundabout at Little Hills and Mulletter Parkway. Mm -hmm. And five is lighting improvements along uh, Freedman's Road. So the first project is the, the West Clay Street uh, Rehabilitation Project. Uh, just a quick overview of the project limits. Uh, some road improvements from Duchenne Road, um, the west end to uh, just west of the loadout right away at First Capital Drive. And includes a realignment of Drosty Road from Charbo Street to Oak Leaf Drive. This is an existing uh, county uh, funded project. The original application in 2015 had two major assumptions that have changed since we've gotten into the design. The biggest ones being it assumed a two inch mill and overlay along West Clay Street and it used the existing storm sewer systems in place. Uh, once we got into design, we did an inspection of the roadway and found that the road was in worse condition than we originally thought. Um, the, the pavement as you can see on some of the photos, has really deteriorated, and we would have to do uh, full depth repairs on 20% of the roadway already. Uh, this project also has a lot of utility trenching on it for some new storm uh, water improvement upgrades and gas main relocations. So we're gonna be tearing up a lot of the pavement. So a mill and overlay is really not the best use of our funds along this corridor. Um, the other thing that we found is when we inspected the storm sewers, they were deteriorated uh, further than we thought. This photo down here in the bottom left shows there's a smaller uh, reinforced concrete pipe that's been shoved inside of a corrugated metal pipe, so the hydraulic capacity of these pipes have gone down. Um, and the inlets that are along here aren't directly connected to the mains. There's actually like a T connection. Uh, so there's a small pipe that connects to the main, and it just makes it more difficult for us to maintain, and the flow through the inlets just isn't uh, to current standards. So just a quick overview of kind of what we're doing now. So instead of doing the mill and overlay, like nearby Duchenne, we're proposing a new full depth pavement replacement, 10 and a half inches of asphalt on top of a four inch aggregate base, and to completely replace the storm sewer system, which is on both sides of the roadway, with uh, larger pipes and more inlets to uh, accommodate the, the roadway drainage. Just kind of an overview of the whole project. So the project did, <coughs> Originally, it did include full depth replacement along the Drosty realignment. It's in a new location. The mill and overlay portions were uh, west of Drosty and east of Drosty. 
So these large areas here was really the areas that are now what's been what's going to be two inches is now ten and a half inches on four inches of rock. Uh, so if we, when we do replace the full depth pavement and replace the storm sewers, we're going to increase our pavement life. We're going to have a smoother road profile. We're able to increase the sl cross slope of the road uh, so we can improve our roadway drainage, restore the hydraulic capacity of our storm sewer system, and improve uh, inlet spacing to accommodate the roadway drainage. So kind of comparison from the 2015 application to the 2018. Uh, in 2015, this was a, about a $6.9 million project with the county um, supporting 65% at $4.5 million. We're now at a $9 million project and requesting an additional uh, million and a half, which would bring the maximum contribution level up to $6 million. So we, we're proposing to keep the 65% reimbursement rate without increasing that. We just want to increase the maximum amount to accommodate these additional improvements that we didn't anticipate in 2015. Uh, the project does have a million dollars in federal funds uh, that are available in October, which is when we plan to start the project, and currently we have submitted the final plans to MoDOT for approval, and we're waiting for that now. So are there any questions on this one? Can I move on? What, what's the tab on undergrounding those utilities? The, the, the power lines. The Amherst relocation is at 500000 and we're still working through the charter relocation, which is estimated at about 100000 Those were not participating. They were included in the original application at the 65%. But it was 65%. Correct. The tab for that over on the drastic piece was over a million dollars. For just the utility relocations? Yeah, it's, it's not that much on this one. I, I just, that, that, that's the one piece that I don't think came through the road board for the most part. I mean, I okay, but not not because of what you did. I just don't know that in that project that got highlighted that utility reload, reload okay. or the undergrounding of it. I mean, my opinion is that's not a part of the road. The city wants to do that. But my personal opinion is the city can pay for it, mm -hmm. like decorative lighting, like other sure. things. But again, uh, we, we that that went to a vote on the addressed it piece, but it never really got discussed on this piece or whatever, and we can certainly take it up in work session and all that, but that's okay. glad it's cheaper anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and so these... I think we had a million on that in federal funds, and I think that got chewed up. The way I looked at it was got chewed up in just underground utilities mm -hmm. for not, very, not a very long stretch, and then right back up in the air. Mm -hmm. So, although I did drive it today, Turned out nice. Yeah, it looks nice. Any other questions on this one? Yeah. So our next project is the uh, Boschtown Road Phase Two. Uh, project limits are from Hector Street. Which actually, there's a St. Charles Fire Station here on Boschtown Road. It's just uh, to the north of that. Uh, so from Hector Street all the way to Highway B, and we're we'll talk about later. But we're looking at relocating a portion of. Boston Town Road to be further uh, west uh, from uh, Highway 94. Just kind of a quick overview of kind of the typical section of of this roadway. Right now, it's a pretty narrow roadway. It's uh, two lanes. They're 10 foot wide. The pavement has deteriorated uh, to a point where uh, we have to fully reconstruct it. There's evidence of vehicles, some tire marks over tracking, the, off tracking the roadway, and there are some pretty steep drop offs and open drainage. Um, so it kind of becomes a dangerous situation. Um, there's no shoulders on the pavement, uh, there's no center turn lane, and then along uh, Highway B, there's a short intersection spacing between Foster Town Road and Highway 94. And along this section of Foster Town Road, we have a lot of increasing. Uh, traffic volumes. So this kind of map kind of shows the overview area. We've got active developments um, with the Charlestown Crossing. There's 240 homes going in right now here. Uh, we've got, uh, they've actually started construction on another 245 homes uh, closer to Highway B. And there's a, uh, Orchard Farms has an early uh, learning center uh, in between the two developments. And they have plans to basically double the size of that today and add an elementary school. 
And there's still a lot of open parcels that uh, there's future plans for uh, with TRUs to develop even further along Highway B. And we we're hearing rumors of other development across from Highway B and along this entire corridor. So with the developments that are even that are planned, we're anticipating the traffic volume to greatly increase. So right now, we see about 2,100 cars along this section of Bosch Town Road. It's going to quadruple to about 8,900 cars within 10 years. I think Orchard Farm School District bought 100 acres on the other side of the beach. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so our proposed improvements, uh, the new uh, roadway section, we're going to widen it. We're going to have a three-lane se section with a continuous center turn lane for the left turn movements. Uh, the lanes will be wider. They'll go from 10 foot to 11 foot wide. We'll have two foot shoulders with some rumble strips to warn drivers when they deviate from the roadway. We're going to improve the open drainage system along the roadway. We're going to have a, a shared use path to separate out any bicyclists or pedestrians from the roadway section. Uh, we're going to relocate uh, the northern portion of Bosch Town Road to be further away from Highway 94. Uh, so that intersection spacing today is at 200 feet and 94 is basically kind of where this behind this large tree here. So we're going to go from 200 feet to 750 feet, which will allow for a lot more queuing to uh, Highway 94. I described most of the, the outcomes of the project. We're going to be able to improve our traffic flow and accommodate the future traffic volumes. We're going to have more capacity along Bosch Town Road and uh, queuing capacity for Highway 94 along uh, Highway B. And it's, we're going to increase safety with that center turn lane and the rumble strips and wider lanes. Uh, <clears throat> this is a project that we have applied for federal funds on. Uh, we did a million each, so a million for the county, a million for the city, and a million of federal funds. <coughs> Uh, if we're not awarded the federal funds, the city, the city is willing to provide the additional fundings. We want to be proactive in this corridor and we're willing to make up the additional funds. Any questions? Is the right of way acquired or donated? Uh, the wire, it's mostly donated. We have a developer agreement with TRDs on the relocation piece, and that's where the right of way is. And I should have mentioned that the preliminary design is completed. So we're, we're very close. If we get the federal funds, we'll need to vote out approval on final plans, but we're, we're ready to, to work on final design. Our next project's the Zumbel Road uh, culvert replacement project. Uh, it's along Cole Creek, which is just south of I-70. Uh, there's the Deerberg's Plaza uh, and Regency Parkway. And this is Cold Creek that kind of runs in between those two roadways. <clears throat> the existing uh, culverts, there's four 13-foot diameter uh, pipes, which classifies it as a bridge on, uh, according to MoDOT. So upstream of uh, Cold Creek, this is a photo looking towards uh, Zumbel Road. There are holes that are in the existing uh, corrugated metal pipes. This is kind of a picture of the holes in the wall. It's hard to see, but there's holes in the flow line. The city made some kind of emergency temporary repairs to one of the cells here, and we just tried to prevent it from deteriorating anymore. Uh, according to MoDOT's bridge inspection, it's got a sufficiency rating of 49%, which classifies it to be structurally deficient and eligible for a full uh, replacement funding. Uh, Zumbo Road is one of our major arterial roadways. There's 24,000 cars a day on it, so we want to make sure that we're proactive in replacing this before it, it fails. Uh, the new uh, reinforced concrete box culvert uh, will be four cells. Each cell will be 12 foot wide by 13 foot high, and it will accommodate a 100 year storm. Uh, the culvert that we're proposing will be lengthened. Uh, we have a, an active uh, uh, corridor study, traffic corridor study along Zumbel that's funded with the county, and we're looking at some traffic flow improvements, and that may include some pavement widening along uh, Zumbel Road. So this, the lengthening of the culvert would accommodate any future improvements along the Zumbel. Um, we're going to be able to flatten our side slopes to eliminate any guardrail, 
and it'll also allow us to phase the construction so that we can keep one lane of traffic open along Zombell while we replace the culvert. It's kind of a, the proposed layout. Um, in this location, there's two left turn lanes, so there's actually six lanes of pavement on top of the, of the culvert. And this is the, the entrance to um, the Deerbergs, Bogle Hills Plaza, and Regency Park is over here, back in the box. So after the project's completed, it's gonna preserve that Zumbel Road traffic corridor so we can keep traffic flowing along there. It's gonna accommodate any future improvements along Zumbel. We're gonna restore the culvert light to be at least 30 years before we need to do any other maintenance on the culvert. And it's gonna be able to maintain that hydraulic capacity of the creek. Uh, we did apply for uh, federal STP funding. Um, we're hopeful that we'll receive that funding and we're just asking to split the remainder, so 10% from the county, so 250000 and it's a two and a half million dollar project. And if the federal funds are not awarded, we're willing to reapply next year. Questions? Our fourth project here uh, is a new roundabout at the intersection of Willow Hills Expressway and Bellwater Parkway. Uh, this is 370 coming from uh, the Discovery Bridge. So the first exit is at uh, 3rd Street or, or the 94 route. And there's no on or off ramps currently at this intersection. We have a, a recent uh, Highway 370 Melwetter Interchange study that the county helps uh, fund. And we got participation from MoDOT and the county on some concepts to help improve access to 370. And this project comes out of the, that study. Um, currently, this intersection is a three-way stop controlled intersection, so there's a stop on every leg of the intersection. This is kind of a view from each leg, so this is looking east, and in the background is kind of the Missouri River, and this is Melwater Parkway. This is looking from the other direction towards the intersection, and then this is along Melwater looking towards Little Hills. Um, today, uh, we do experience some delays at this intersection because there's a stop on every leg. So it currently operates at a level of service of C, and that results in uh, 20 seconds of delay during the PM peak hour. So if we do nothing in the future, uh, we've got some increasing traffic volumes from the growing developments that are along Bottertown and the development at the Villages of Provence, kind of a nearby area off Duchenne. Uh, the traffic volume is going to increase to where this intersection is going to fail. It's going to be a level service of an F, and though we're projecting uh, 50 seconds of delay during the PM uh, peak hour. <clears throat> this is kind of the concept that we're proposing right now. So uh, we would construct a new uh, roundabout all within city owned property. The city owns this parcel in here, so we would not need to require any additional right of way. Uh, we'll need to reestablish. There is a trail network uh, along Little Hills that we'll have to reestablish that connection across Mellwetter. It's still fairly minor um, you know, for the impacts of the trail. And then really this sets us up for the future uh, on and off ramps to 370 that I'll show you in a minute here. So this is kind of the, the future overall layout with on and off ramps that would connect to the roundabout. So we're trying to phase this to where this is all on city owned property. Don't really need uh, MoDOT permission or approval for this portion. So while we work on the MoDOT coordination and participation on the other phase, we want to be proactive in getting this part started. So after we construct a project, we're gonna improve the traffic flow at the intersection. It's gonna go from existing level service of C to an A. Uh, the roundabouts are safer. They have less conflict points than a traditional intersection. And it's gonna reduce our vehicle emissions because we aren't having to wait as long during that PM peak hour. We're not sitting there idling. We're able to continuously flow through that intersection. So that uh, results in us submitting a federal CMAC application 
Uh, so we did request a million dollars in CMAC funding, and then if and we splitted the remainder, so we're requesting 500,000 from the county. It's a total two million dollar project, and then if we don't uh, receive any uh, federal funds, we're willing to reapply the following year. When do we anticipate finding about on East West Gateway? So um, they are supposed to have a draft um, list of recommended projects at our meeting on August 8th. So you should know before the work session, as, as long as everything goes well at Gateway. That's the biggest problem. <laughs> So our last project here is the Freedom's Road Lighting Safety Improvements Project, and it's from Highway 94 all the way to Arena Parkway, uh, South River Road. <clears throat> the existing Freedom's Road, it's a minor arterial roadway. You see about 6,500 cars a day on it. The speed limit is fairly high at 40 miles per hour. It has rolling terrain with a lot of trees that you can kind of see in these photos. There's it's tree lined along almost all of it except closer to uh, 94. Um, <clears throat> there's no street lighting on it today. So, with just the ambient lighting, if we did a light level study on there and just the way that they measure or calculate it, it's called foot candles. So, it, <clears throat> currently we see point, an average of 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 foot candles along the roadway pavement. And our current standards today is a 0.4 foot candles minimum. And that's what will be designed towards. Um, in this section of uh, roadway from in three years, from 2014 to 2016, we saw over 200 crashes. 30% of them were during the night. Um, so we're hoping that with the lighting improvements that we can reduce the nighttime crashes. Uh, the city is installing another uh, a mid block pedestrian crossing in this area. Uh, for ADA access to the Katy Trail, we received some complaints about uh, not being able to have access. There's a lot of residential uh, neighborhoods along this corridor and a pretty heavy uh, walking community. And they started complaining about there not being any ADA access, so we want to accommodate for them. So the city, separate to this project, will be installing that this year in this location. So there's kind of two uh, aspects to this project. There's the new street lighting, which is the roadway lighting, similar to this picture here. Uh, this is off Drosty Road. This is the new lighting we put in. So we're asking for funding of just a standard 40-foot high light. Uh, it's a 40 watt, 400 watt uh, LED luminaire. And with this project, we have 56 street lights going in. The city will fund any of the decorative features, any of the pedestrian light. So the little uh, uh, luminaire that comes off the side, the city will fully fund that, and we'll fully fund the poles that look like this, the shorter 15-foot high poles with the uh, small, <coughs> with the 100-watt LED luminaires. Um, so there'll be 73 of those along this entire corridor. Uh, to, <coughs> to get the new lighting, we'll have to install a new conduit and power for the lighting, and then the, <coughs> the lighting design will meet the 0.4-foot uh, candles minimum. Kind of have, we ran this through a, uh, some lighting software. This is kind of the existing uh, condition, the existing photo of Freedom's Road. Um, and this is our model during the daytime. And really what I want to highlight, any obstructions in the roadway, it could be people, it could be a dog, it could be just debris, like a tire. Uh, the lighting improvements are gonna help highlight any, uh, make it more visible to see any obstructions within the, right, <coughs> within the roadway. And then this is kind of another photo along the sidewalk. So when we model this at the nighttime condition with no street lighting, it's extremely dark and it's, you can't even see the silhouettes on, maybe barely see them, uh, with just regular headlights and some of the ambient lighting that's coming off the, the homes. But when we add the street lighting, you're starting to see some of the silhouettes come back. You're able to see some of the obstructions that might be on the roadway. So after the project's completed, we're going to meet the current uh, 0.4 foot candle uh, standard along the, the, the roadway. It's going to increase our safety by improving the visibility of obstacles in the roadway. Uh, according to the crash modification factors clearinghouse, 
uh, lighting can cause a 28% potential reduction in, in accidents at night. Uh, so the city is requesting 80%, uh, which is about 900,000 of a 1.1 million dollar project for just the street lighting, and the city will fund an additional 900,000 for the pedestrian lighting and any decorative features. That's all for the city of St. Charles. Any questions? All right, thank you very much. Next up, City of Weldon Spring. I'm Mike Miners uh, from St. Charles Engineering from the City of Near Weldon Spring. The Weldon Spring proposes to improve uh, Salomon Road. And I guess. Uh, Salomon Road is uh, off of Pippin Hill Road, uh, not far from Highway 94. We're proposing to improve uh, about 2,400 uh, feet, about uh, 0.4 miles of Salomon Road. Uh, Currently, uh, it's, it's uh, serving uh, some subdivisions, Renaissance Crossing, Lucerne Manor, and Weldon Spring, and uh, recently being developed subdivision, uh, uh, Elman Farms. Uh, there's a couple sharp curves on Salmon Road, uh, very sharp, about 50 foot radius. Uh, this particular curve was improved as forced by the city with the developer of Elman Farms. Uh, City of St. Peter's uh, uh, Highland subdivision is probably the main traffic generator on Salmon Road. Uh, Salmon Road in the future would be uh, part of our thoroughfare plan that would be part of the outer road system to Highway uh, 94. However, this parcel is uh, in the floodplain. It would eventually, should it ever be developed, the city would require this developer to extend uh, Salomon Road to eventually be connected to Wolfram Way, which, which goes on, I'll show you in the thoroughfare plane. This parcel is actually in St. Peter's. It's not developed either, but the thoroughfare plan for the City Well and Spring shows, uh, here's Pittman Hitter, here's Salomon Road, shows uh, Salomon Road part of the outer road system that would go down, eventually connecting the seed and top, uh, Well and Spring Parkway was funded by the road board uh, in two segments, and that would be part of the future outer road, but these parcels are not developed. Uh, as those parcels are developed, the city will require at least the right-of-way, potentially uh, them, the developers to install a proper roadway. Uh, Salmon Road was formerly uh, Salmon Farm Driveway. It was overlaid. Uh, with two inch overlay in 94, 2004, and 2014, just basically directly on the gravel road, no horizontal or vertical realignment at that point. Uh, traffic count in 2014 was 2,043 AD, uh, average daily traffic. Uh, as I mentioned, there's four subdivisions. Uh, we, re we required the one sharp curve uh, to be uh, uh, reconstructed. And, for the most part, the road is a 19-foot uh, wide road. St. Charles County is uh, proposing to, or is developing Veterans Tribute Park, uh, which is you know, on Pittman Hill Road. It's right, right, almost right across from the intersection of Salmon Road. Uh, the parking area, the Veterans Tribute Park, uh, does not have access on Pittman Hill Road, only trail access. Currently, there's no pedestrian route or bicycle route on Pittman Hill Road to get to Pittman Hill, or on Salmon Road to get to Pittman Hill Road. And there's potential safety issues with pedestrians and bicyclists using uh, Salmon Road to access the park. Thus, that's the main reason this application was submitted. As I mentioned, this is being developed by the county. Salmon Road right here. Pittman Hill Road goes through Salmon 
I'm sorry, the Douglas Farm was purchased by the county. This park is under construction. Kisker is here. This is the access to the parking area to the park. So basically, um, we're, we're assuming most of the residents will try to use this trail system. And uh, the city anticipates some increased foot traffic and potential bicycle traffic on Salmon Road. This is a view of Salmon Road uh, from Pittman Hill. Uh, generally, the pavement is, is 19 feet wide. This is Renaissance Place. When it was constructed, it put in normal entrance with the uh, acceleration deceleration lanes. The county subsequently ended up paving a section widening Tippin Hill up to that to that entrance. This is uh, the view of uh, from Pittman Hill Road. This is Salmon. You can see there's no crosswalk here across Pittman Hill Road. Shouldn't be because there's no sidewalks on Salmon. Uh, this is up. Uh, uh, Salmon Road a little ways. It's, uh, the next entrance is Lucerne Manor. A few years ago, after Lucerne Manor was constructed, the city paved this section of the road. So at least you have a wider road <coughs> between Lucerne Manor and Pittman Hill now. Looking from Lucerne Manor up, you can see the, the arrow, that's a, uh, about 50 degree radius curve. You can see how the, the, the road's just been paved without any real true uh, vertical alignment. This is looking back at that sharp curve. I happened to uh, snap a picture with four cars and it was not my intention to do that, uh, but there's a lot of traffic that runs on the road. That's that sharp 50 degree angle, uh, 50 degree radius curve. The road, I did a phaser rating on the road, pavement's conditioned about three. So it's got a lot of alligator cracking and uh, a lot of failures on the side. Looking back in the other direction, uh, this is a bit of a site issue. We need some vertical realignment. Uh, this is a curve that the city had the developer improve. Um, and then looking from St. Peter's back to uh, where we're proposing uh, that St. Peter's widened salmon a little bit at the entrance into Highland subdivision, which is on my right here. Uh, Serves, it probably is, as I mentioned, the main traffic generator. The existing right of way is 50 feet wide. We're proposing the typical cross section for the previous City of Welland Spring Road projects, which would be two 12 foot driving lanes, four foot wide bike lanes on each side of the road, curb and gutters with storm sewers, and a 10 foot wide multi use trail. We would end up uh, uh, implementing a, a, this is the concept. Uh, for the for the road with a uh, left turn lane at Pippin Hill. Uh, currently, we don't see needs for left turn lanes into Renaissance Place or Lucerne Manor due to the fact that uh, most of the tra those people are almost always going out to Pippin Hill Road, and the people that are traveling towards Pippin Hill Road really don't have a need to go into those subdivisions. Uh, this curve would be improved with the project. This curve has already been, been improved. So as I mentioned, two, two 12 foot lanes, uh, bike lanes, outside the lanes, uh, curb and gutter sections, and the, the 10 foot <coughs> wide trail. Uh, the estimated cost for the project is almost 1.9 million. We're looking for 45% from the road board. We did apply for uh, federal funding at 45%. And, and the, uh, I didn't bring a complete breakdown, but it is in the packet with all the, uh, and I have it here if you have some questions on, on how it's broken down. Uh, you know, planning, planning and engineering 2019, 2020, there's a little bit of offset on the money between the road board and the federal money, but that their fiscal year is a little bit different, I believe. And then the right away proposing 2020, 2021, and then construction 21, 22. I think if we get federal funding, I believe that would push us out a little bit because their applications were, were 20, 21, 22, the ones that I just recently filled out. So benefits would provide safer traffic movement, even though that's not the major reason that we're, we're uh, uh, preparing the application or submitting it. Provide a pedestrian route to the park, provide better bicycle or uh, bicycle route to the park, 
construction of the segment of the city thoroughfare plan <coughs> and propose healthy activity as pedestrians bike with bicyclists. <laughs> I'm thirsty as heck. Get an alter alternative to get to the park instead of driving all the way to Kistaber Road to enter the park or attempt to go down Salmon Road on foot or on bike, which we hope does not happen. Stakeholders, really the City of Welland Springs, City of St. Peter's, and the St. Charles County Parks Department. Should we not get funding, we're, this is the verbiage is we would potentially ask the county to consider uh, to fund the project, certainly at 80%, and the city would go to 20%. Uh, certainly if we don't, uh, we aren't successful with the federal money, uh, we'll reapply. But this, I think this does have merit. Uh, due to the safety issues and, and with the park being developed, it's being graded. And everybody knows about the park now. So. Uh, I believe that's all I have for you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Well, the city of Wentzville. Works of the City of Wentzville. I'd first like to thank the boards for the time tonight for the sponsors to present these different projects that they're being weighed coming into this next round of applications. So the city does have five projects tonight. They are listed on the board at this time a little differently than within your packet, but this is the priority the city has discussed with the elected officials and staff and feels that a lot of these projects you've seen before either in smaller pieces or different components or maybe as applications from St. Charles County in the past. So our first project will be Wentzville Parkway South Phase 1. That primarily focuses on interchange improvements right at Veterans Memorial Parkway and I-70. Our West Pierce Boulevard and Meyer Road traffic signal. Third is a Piney Road safety improvement. This was a project previously submitted by St. Charles County, I believe in 2013, and that looked at improving the roadway really from Highway 61 through several 90 degree turns before you get into the city portion of the roadway. Our, third, our fourth project will be the next phase, phase two, as well as a small 2A portion of Winsville Parkway South. And last, what we're doing is a Great Oaks Boulevard extension. We did present this for a full project in the past to do design right away and construction. However, at this time, we are looking at just an extension design project. So we said a little bit of background. What we're looking at for Wentzville Parkway South Phase 1 really looks at kind of the shaded area here, Veterans Memorial Parkway. And what we're really looking at was this was part of a 2012 study that the St. Charles County Road Board did help fund that looked at establishing that corridor to get all the way south to Wilmer Road from Veterans Memorial Parkway. And it really is kind of a key arterial roadway for north-south connectivity for not only the city but as well as St. Charles County and the region. We did a supplemental study in 2016 and this looked at some different improvements at the interchange as well as evaluated whether it would be a grade separated or an accurate crossing of the railroad. And then in 2017, with uh, St. Charles County itself, we were able to acquire right-of-way for the Super 8 Hotel, as well, well as a key parcel further down that was most formerly the car credit city. So both those parcels have been acquired and either have been torn down or are scheduled to be torn down. We talked about what we're really looking at. The existing conditions that we have are really just an issue of volume and congestion. That PM AM movement is really two left turn lanes to get onto a single ramp onto I-70. So it's just a high volume, about 25,000 cars a day utilizing that roadway itself. And then you also have the issue of two very tightly spaced traffic signals at Veteran Memorial Parkway and the off and on ramps from eastbound and on the eastbound. So there's about 110 feet between those two signals. So really when you're functioning there, it's really about two to three cars is all that you can really stack between those two signals. So it really limits the really function of that interchange. So what this would look to do is to take that really heavy dominant left turn movement in the morning and it would allow you basically to right turns and then utilizing the roundabout to get on to I-70. And a secondary benefit that we did discuss with MoDOT of this back in 2016, that really has some implications for MoDOT as well as Federal Highway, is it allows some safety improvement on I-70 as well. As you have the very short ramp currently that goes from the existing gore and then ends at the S-curve of the railroad viaduct and there's very limited ability to do anything with that at this time. And as we know, the interchange or the I-70 improvements are a very large costly expense. So what this does by folding that eastbound on-ramp west of Wentzville Parkway, 
allows us to add about 1,200 feet, give or take, to that ramp, giving it greater time for acceleration as well as merging on the ISEP. I think just a little bit when we're looking at some of our performance measures are the congestion reduction. What we have right now is about 135 seconds of delay associated with particularly that AN movement. And with the improvements there, we drop that to about 35 seconds would be the anticipated delay on that. So a significant savings of almost 100 seconds there for those 25,000 vehicles making that movement. We also have transportation system reliability, and as well as looking to begin some multimodal transportation access on there as well. So what we were looking at, this is a current CMAC application that's being proposed and is pending that decision. What we looked at is an overall 30 split, 30 30 city, and a 40% funding from CMAC. It's about $4.9 million, leaving the city and county both at $1.47 million for the share of this project. I think we have recently clarified some questions from Federal Highway about the project and how the access to I 70 would go in. So it does involve an AJR, but the schedule we're looking at at this time would still be a 2019 design pre construction activities of some small amount of right-of-way for the kind of jug handle road to get access to all those parcels, and then utility relocations in 20 with construction beginning in 21. Any questions on the first project? Okay. The second project we have just to lead with is, again, a CMAC application. This kind of came about as one of the first phases we can bring from the Winsville Downtown Transportation Revitalization Study that the Brobar participated in. So this is kind of one of the first projects that Really, we identified that we could get moving much quicker than some of the other projects itself. So, a little background, it's right now is a four-way stop control. CBB did a study for us back in 2014 looking at what some of the delays are associated with that. And then again in 2018 as part of the downtown study. And this has also been, you know, really identified and was brought about in the St. Charles County traffic study as an area that did have an increased safety risk along that corridor. we have here is we have two four-way stops on Pierce Boulevard. There's about 13,100 cars, give or take a day through there. And what that really creates is in the PM peak, backs up a lot of traffic through there and extends to where we have about 58 seconds delay. The current four-way intersection operates at the level of service F in the PM. So what the signal line, signalization of that first intersection will allow, will, will allow us to remove the four-way at Sherrill Ann, but that is just a two-way stop control, utilizing the signal for the gaps in space of access. So it does reduce that down to an eight second delay, which puts it at a level service of A at that time with those improvements. Pending the CMAC application, so a $700,000 project with some utility conflicts and things in there as well. It also does also look at AD enhancements at the intersection, as well as some turn radius improvements that would push that back and allow better access onto the roadway. It is here a 40-10 split between the city and county and then with the CMAC at 50% of $350,000. Last project, this one, was presented by St. Charles County and it really was looking at safety along this corridor that again is one of those two lane, very narrow, about 21 feet wide of pavement county roadways that really was never intended or designed for the higher volumes of residential traffic that are currently experiencing. And I think just uh, a little background that we have on this one is our ADTs are current, they were taken right kind of before the application process with about 3,100 cars through there now and that takes into account that that is with the Piney P61 interchange construction. So we're really assuming that those current counts are really down with people avoiding that overall intersection and limited access at this time. So what we're really looking at is we have about 300 future residential units that have gone through the preliminary development process kind of right off in this green space. There's 240 acres in there that was part of a preliminary plan several years ago. It winds up being a little over 600 residential units that will fit into that area when it's fully developed. So what we're looking at with this project is really to widen that 20 foot, 21 foot section, really just looking at safety improvements for three foot wide shoulders, as well as addressing some of the very hard 90 degree corners that you can see on here. The 12 crashes in the last three years are really, nine of those were running off the road or crossing the center line. We do have a right of way here that was part of that original development, so it'll allow us to soften that curve considerably. We actually had one of those 12 crashes was a car that wound up in the uh, kind of kitchen there of the house right on the corner. So there's some significant safety concerns associated with that. And if anybody's driven the road, the roadway itself is, is uh, it's a very hilly road that has some side distance, as we'll see on the next picture here. Really, it would just be a safety improvement. We are not really proposing what our typical three-lane section would be through the residential area because this is parallel by David Hope Parkway just to the north. 
So it's one that it really is something we were just looking to get ahead of the development, ahead of the Piney P61 interchange opening up, and really expecting a drastic increase in the ADPs and that, not just from new development, but from residents all on the northern section of the city utilizing that as opposed to Winslow Park. So here we can see a little bit. This is kind of one of the first 90s you're looking at, so definitely limited side distance along with constrained roadway. This is the one here where we did have a vehicle recently went off the road kind of this way, either missed the turn or high speed on the corner and kind of wind up in the backyard, kind of the kitchen of that house. And then a couple of views from the bottom are just the kind of narrow nature of the road as well as the limited side distance and curves. This one now we were looking at is just a typical 80-20 split for the municipalities. It's about a $2.3 million proposed project. So $1.84 million to St. Charles County and the city picking up the $460,000 for the safety improvements. Our fourth priority project, and that's really a lot of this is based not on necessarily overall need for the city, but it's based on one as far as timing and how the projects can work together, would be Winslow Parkway Phase 2, and then we have noted on here 2A as well. The Phase 2 we looked at is Veterans Memorial South Interstate Drive, so it would construct a great separated bridge over the railroad and get down to Interstate Drive and really provide, I think what we looked at here is just also an alternate route to I-70. So between David Hopel Parkway and Winslow Parkway connecting to Interstate Drive gives that alternate route to bypass any incidents on 70 and get to 64 in an alternative method. So again, we had the 2012 and 2016 studies. We have acquired right away and are in the process of or have demolished Super 8 if anyone's been through there. So you can definitely see where the roadway goes through at this time that was maybe a little unclear in the past or people had questions on that. Phase 2A was really driven by a uh, private-public partnership. We had a development that was proposed on the south side of the city, and a lot of our elected and residents' concerns revolved around the fact that the south side of the city is very congested, some of the roadways are very difficult and not designed for that volume of traffic. So what the private developer came to us is kind of a, another way or a new way to look at their development was to participate in the extension of Winsville Parkway south of Interstate Drive to access their new development via an alternative route as opposed to the existing Wilmer County Road. That's kind of what's in two pieces. It is definitely a little bit different as far as how to look at those as two parts. So existing conditions are again no roadway at all, so it is greenfield construction. Uh, what we would look at is to begin with is a two-lane cross-section. It would be fully designed for the full four-lane build-out but due to economic constraints it would really just be a two-lane section to get that traffic connection to the south. We would also include with that the six-foot sidewalk along the east, as well as on 2A for pedestrian connectivity. We have just really limited capacity of Wilmer Road. We've got continuing residential growth along that corridor and a lot of interest along Interstate Drive, as well as commercial development. This really looks at kind of the light-colored area would be the initial, and the full shaded area would be the complete build-out upon the demand for that additional roadway volume. So performance measures, again, are a delay reduction. We're looking to give people on the south side of the city a better, safer alternative route to get to I-70 than Highway Z, Wilmer Road, or possibly even Hepperman Road. And we also have safety improvements along there with the grade-separated railroad crossing and the existing aggregate crossings. This project is, however, a very large and expensive project based on the railroad crossing, the amount of MSE walls that are required and filled. It is a $10 million project and really at this point, our understanding is it's not really eligible for any federal dollars based on it being a new greenfield construction and doesn't meet any criteria for SDP or CMAC. So what we really look for is the 80-20 split with the county's portion of $8 million for that $10 million project. The Phase 2A, a little bit different than what shows on here. I think in your packet it's one where the Phase 2A portion it's a little bit smaller, it's kind of an odd split. It's a 42.8% on the county, about 326,000, with the developer and the city splitting the remaining 28% evenly there at 217. And the only difference from the thing on here is that the private developer would look to accelerate this all to basically be expended in 2019. So they would look to accelerate the design on their own part and be ready to have this constructed and able to be an access point for that future development sooner rather than our typical three year time. Our last project is one that we have presented before as the full design from not being successful at that time, but going out in our board's direction, we did visit with the family that is the primary person necessary for 
This is all owned by the Piney family, and it is one, it's a century farm registered with the University of Missouri. So we did begin conversation with them a little bit over a year ago, I guess, and met with them numerous times. And while they aren't completely opposed to the roadway, they still just have some reservations, and there's numerous family members, and everybody is not on board yet at this time with making the connection. But I think it's one we've started to really get the phone calls coming in from the Timber Trace subdivision as well as others along Highway 61 that while everybody realizes now when you close the full access to Timber Trace World Outdoor Emporium and MoDOT's facility, there need to be you know, alternative routes that we're already looking to design for the outer road. But this is one of those shorter, smaller connections that from a cost standpoint is more effective at getting those residents safely back into the city. So really what we would try to do with this project is pin down the design a little bit closer, work with the family during the process to identify what some of their concerns are, really pin down what the right-of-way needs are from them, and possibly some of the things that could be done with the roadway design to not impact their farm and their family as much. So what we're trying to do is really, again, get ahead of some of that growth and development. We have concerns that Timber Trace has almost, there'll be close to 525 homes in there when it's completed. Their only access will be Highway 61 is a ride in ride out so their evening trip home in the p.m. if they're headed northbound will be about a two mile round trip to go piney road make you turn at the new interchange and then come back to the right in would be their primary access point so i think this is really just again looking at the 61 corridor as it gets closer to that interstate standard of limited access and just find, finding ways for our residents to get safely back into the city it is the time just the design so we're looking at 180 thousand dollars with 80 percent from the county and 144 thousand and that would be a 2019 and then depending upon being able to take the design back to the family would definitely follow up with more of a construction project down the road. And that's it tonight. Anybody has any questions? Is that 2A conditional on 2 getting approved? 2A can actually function separately and that's really what we would look for is that you could still use interstate drive as the access point to get to 2A and then the residents at that point would have the option to take Wilmer Road, Highway Z, or Hepperman to get to Veterans Memorial and I-70. They're not really attached then, so. Not really attached, just really on there it is. I think what we look at too is that eventually it's just kind of that next step and the next leg to get Wentzville Parkway South to Wilmer Road and this is just kind of a way to help with the funding a little bit, that private-public partnership that we've utilized in the past in some instances is a way to maybe get one of those legs quicker than what we would have anticipated. How much traffic do you think uh, will the two-way portion carry? We're going to have Kevin on, I think a lot of our sections really, you know, kind of depends on there. We can get more specifics from the study back to you on that one. But I think what we have looked at is really, when our consultant had looked at that, it really was something that we would look in a 10 to 15 year range as far as really being able to support that. It's a little hard to depend. Basically, the interstate drive piece from there on either side of Winslow Parkway South is currently in the land use plan. It's commercial. So a lot of it would even depend what those end uses are and what they would generate. So if it's just your standard retail, not as much, uh, you could definitely generate some higher volumes of traffic. So I think we would. I'm sorry, the, the 2A, uh, the developer for, for 2A is originally, initially proposing a uh, 99 lot uh, residential development that would uh, connect onto it. And then there are some commercial parcels so the residential, if it's 99, call it 100 lots, uh, with you know maybe nine to ten trips per day. So about 1,000 ADT on two way just for the residential, and depending on if the commercial develops, uh, what what that would generate. Maybe 2000. Really, the two lane going over the railroad the way it is, there's limited access or turn movements or anything like that until you hit interstate drive. And then we so far don't really use interstate drive for those commercial access points as being a three lane section that is. So, it should hopefully be able to have a fairly long service life with just the two lanes. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any new business this evening? Right. Under old business, you'll see next month we will just have a work session, not a formal meeting, so there will be nothing voted on, no public comment. Uh, we don't really need the sponsors there, so you know, for road board members, we'll probably have some food at that kind of a, just a working uh, dinner meeting. So I will be here same time, 4:30. So anything else for this evening? I'm sorry I was late, but for um, Winston St. Charles, I was at MoDOT doing the I-70 selection for the preliminary engineering. So 
So and hopefully they'll have some video on board soon. So it's exciting. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Thank you, motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Make sure your time.